I want to talk and go to a quote which I just spoke to Angela Sten about, the great author of Putin. This is Vladimir Putin in Russia two days ago, uh, an Associated Press translation, obviously for the Russian audience. The thing we do, on one hand, we help people saving them from Nazism. On the other hand, we take measures to ensure Russia's own security. You are more qualified than anyone. Your heritage of Bulgaria, your grandfather was a patriot of Bulgaria. You have lived under this Karl Marx University and such. You personally must be thunderstruck. And with members of the greater Gorgiev clan in Ukraine now, just for a moment, what has the last 50 days been like for you and your family? It has been horrific. A war is a terrible thing. For my family, what it means is threat to their safety, more difficult to find food and more expensive to buy it, no medicines, and above all, that sense that the war would not soon end. Getting out there in Kharkiv, in the eastern part of uh, Ukraine, is close to impossible. Why? They are very close to the Russian border and very far from the Polish uh, and other borders of Ukraine. But in this horror of war, what impressed me the most is the strength that they demonstrate for the future of Ukraine. My sister-in-law's message is we will win this war. Can they do it alone? And the distinction of my interviews with the right and the left, the politically savvy and not, is this timidity about starting a World War III. Now, that's not your mm -hmm. mandate at IMF. But I would like you to comment on how you perceive the shock of the Western world mm -hmm. and their tentativeness in assisting not only Ukraine, but all of Eastern Europe, up, frankly, to mm -hmm. Finland. Mm -hmm. Well, the um, um, reality of this war is it is about Ukraine and it is beyond Ukraine. It is about Ukraine because its existence is being threatened, but also the post-world order is being threatened. And in this sense, the war affects all of us. If we are to allow a 21st century military takeover of a country in Europe that is detrimental to Europe, it is detrimental to the world. And what we have to recognize that the war is having consequences reaching far and fast. It affects hundreds of millions of people through three main channels. Mm -hmm. One, commodity prices, especially food, energy, but also yes. metals. Mm -hmm. And food prices are up at the time they were pushed already up by bad harvest well, I in want many to talk, places. I want to talk about the food in a minute, and that's going to be the main part of our mm. conversation with what we see are the challenges of the IMF in helping Sri Lanka, Peru, and others. Mm. But I, I, I want you to comment on the scope and scale we see. This is mm. something you're expert in academically. And another expert, Janet Yellen, who has mm. a little bit of experience with the mm. trillions word, says we're getting the magnitude right. Yellen says we need to think in trillions, not billions. Mm. Mm -hmm. As you go to your spring meetings and, frankly, to your October meetings, do we have the magnitude wrong of what is needed? Well, uh, Janet Yellen is right. We need trillions, and we have been talking about these trillions for years. How can we transform billions into trillions? Well, first, by all of us working together. We cannot have fragmented deployment of scarce development international finance resources. Two 
by embracing a very simple principle. Public money should be used for only one of two things, to finance what private money would never finance and to remove barriers for private finance in emerging markets mm -hmm. and developing economies. And we are still short of embracing entirely this principle. At the IMF, our concentration is when we have a program in a country, is this program going to open up space for private sector-led growth, for jobs that come because vibrant investments are being made. Mm -hmm. And when we, when we look at the countries that are now in difficulty, we are determined to have, help them have fundamentals that would make mm -hmm. that private sector-led growth possible. I want to talk about the mechanisms here and then get to the food crisis. Our Eric Martin is front and center on this and looking nation to nation mm -hmm. at where the greatest challenges are. The, 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 the nuance here is the solution domestically for these troubled nations in food is price control. Mm. To keep the price of bread down, to keep the price of wheat down, the price of rice down, etc. The IMF comes in and says, okay, you're broke, fine, let us help mm. you fix it, but there needs to be a new Me mechanism given the magnitude and the shock of this inflation. Mm. Explain the new mechanism or process you will use to move from domestic controls over to something that's more modern Western capitalist. How do you how do you get from A to B? We have been on this now for quite some time, and you're yes. right. We have to get uh, even faster on that path. And what we are working with countries to do is to have targeted assistance. Uh, so there is social protection that identifies who are the vulnerable that need to be helped. What is the problem with price controls? Everybody benefits from it. The rich benefit mm -hmm. and the poor. But if the country doesn't have a social safety net, if they don't know who their vulnerable families are, they are bound to go for price controls because that's the only thing they can do. And by the way, at this moment of time, in some circumstances, we would say, this is not your first best, it's not even your second best, but given the speed with which prices are jumping, right. there is some, some logic in making sure people don't go hungry. How do we think about this in the future? Uh, uh, we have two, two complementary strategies. One is what I just described. Mm -hmm. Target your, your public spending. For God's sake, don't throw good money in the direction of rich people. Second, think about food in a more sustainable manner. Remember, this year, food crisis has already been knocking on the door before the war because of climate change, because of climate shocks, because agriculture in Africa <coughs> okay. is rain-fed. You have no rain, you have no food. We have to think about sustainability and resilience in a more shock-prone world differently. Okay, but let's, I want to digress here, and I do want to come back to food. And folks, if you're just joining us on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, Kristalina Gorgieva, the IMF Managing Director here in a conversation, I can say in all my years of doing this, a critical point into the spring meetings of the IMF uh, next week. I want to digress here on climate change. I was at the Paris Accords and the, the advancements that have been made. Tell me of the derailment of the need to burn coal. How temporary is that, or has there been a seismic shift for climate change? It is temporary. I don't see coal persisting for much longer. Why? Because one of the benefits, the silver lining, if you wish, of high energy prices is they make renewables more viable. And they inevitably you, would accelerate. You believe we'll see substitution oh, yes, in here to will. assist? Yes. How long would it take? I am not an okay. energy expert. I would not guess. <clears throat> but the direction to travel is uh, 
clean energy. Okay, fine. Just because of time, I really want to mm. get all these issues in. We see Peru, we see Sri Lanka, mm. we see Egypt, which is a mm -hmm. much larger, bigger problem. Yeah. That's the focus of our Eric Martin. If I see these different companies in maximum distress, mm. it alludes to the Arab Spring, to Tunisia, and mm. almost a domino effect of an unraveling. Are we near not an Arab Spring, but a war crisis where we get a domino effect of food crises? We have to get on top of the food crisis. We need to front it right now. And we can. We have learned lessons about it. We know how to do it. Uh, but even if we front it, more countries would be in trouble. Why? Because in 2020, everybody had to borrow more to sustain an economy in standstill. Mm -hmm. Largest With increase in debt because yeah. of the pandemic. Yeah. In 21, servicing this debt was easy. It was actually cheaper in some mm -hmm. places because interest rates were so low or negative. 2022, no more. With tightening of financial conditions, servicing right. debt is getting more expensive. Now, good news, not so good news. Good news is that we see that, we follow it, and we are already zeroing in on, on the countries uh, that are in need of debt restructuring. We have to press for debt well, restructuring. Well, you have Sri Lanka on Monday, right? This? They're coming into Dulles, and the, they're going to they, come in, and you're going to sit with Sri Lanka. We what, would how sit do you with Sri Lanka. That? We would sit with Egypt. We would sit with uh, Tunisia, and we would discuss with mm -hmm. them realistically what needs to be done. One, one thing that I saw, Sri Lanka has appointed very prominent Sri Lankan economists to be advisors. That right. gives me hope that they're okay. saying, OK, we have to Again, solve our Again, because of time, I've got to move on. Yeah. Everybody in G7 is focused on this, except Mr. Macron. He's got to get reelected, so we'll give him a, a, a pass mm -hmm. right now. What do you need from G7 to affect at maximum IMF uh, tactics and issues in this crisis? We need from G7 support for deploying the full set of instruments of the IMF fast. And we need space to build it for the future. Yesterday, our board approved a new instrument. First time in the history of the IMF, we have a long-term financing mm -hmm. instrument specifically for pandemic preparedness and for climate action. What we want is to think of building that resilience I talked about right. in a more comprehensive way. Tom, before when IMF says resilience, we mean banking sector, financial stability. Now it's broader. Now it is broader. We have to have people that are healthy and educated. <clears throat> we have to have right. the economy more, more vibrant. We have to have digital money integrated mm -hmm. today okay. in the way we would function tomorrow. You are a tough nut. The way you came up with some real struggle in Bulgaria, your academics and the work, and you've just got that certain manner of, you do this thing, and you're like, let's go, let's go, let's go. What do you say mm -hmm. to the IMF nations supporting Mr. Putin? Whether it's direct, maybe it's somewhat indirect, think India, China, etc. How does the IMF address those nations that mm. aren't on board helping Ukraine? Think of the interest of your people. Over the last decades of integrated global economy, we have tripled the size of global GDP. Tripled. Who benefited the most? Emerging markets, developing economies. Their size mm. increased four and a half times. Their poor, poor people are fewer. Their, their middle class has expanded. An integrated economy in which we can work together benefits you.